I've really been trying to understand the underlying psychology of postmodernism and its relationship with neo-Marxism and then the spread of that into the universities and the effect on the culture. And what I would like to start with is a description of your understanding of that because I, like I've presented to the people who are listening to me my understanding of it. I interviewed Stephen Hicks recently and he wrote an interesting book called Explaining Postmodernism, which I liked quite a bit. It's been criticized for being too right wing, although I don't think he's right wing at all. I, th I think maybe you could characterize him as, as middle of the road conservative, but I would say he's more like a classic liberal. But I'm really curious about your views about, well, well what, what postmodernism is, first of all, I know you've, you've identified it with the, with the general tricksters, Derrida and Lacan and Foucault, and Foucault in particular you've talked about, but I'd like to know what you think about postmodernism and also why you think it's been so attractive to people. Well, my explanation is that there is no authentic 1960s point of view in any of the elite universities. Okay? But, but rather, the, the most liberated minds of my generation of the 1960s did not go on to graduate school. I witnessed this with my own eyes. I saw genuine Marxists okay, at my college, which was the State University of New York at Binghamton, upstate New York, uh, Harper College, which had a huge cohort of very radical downstate New York Jews, okay, who, in fact, the Harper used to be called Berkeley East. So I saw genuine, passionate Marxists with my own eyes. They were not word choppers. They were not snide postmodernists, okay. They were in your face, aggressive. They used the language of the people. They had a populist energy. Okay? They dressed working class. They were non-materialistic. Okay? These are people who lived by their own convictions. They were against the graduate schools. Right? When, I, when I, uh, just went on to graduate school and, and it became known that I was going to go to Yale, I was confronted by a leader of the radicals on campus right? in broad daylight in front of everyone who denounced me for, he said, graduate school is not where it's happening. You don't, you don't do that. And if you have to go to graduate school, you should go to Buffalo. Now, I had applied to, the, to, to SUNY Buffalo because the great leftist critic Leslie Fiedler was there, who had a huge impact on me. He's, he created, created identity politics, but without its present distortions. Right? Uh, and Norman Holland, the psychoanalytic critic, was there. I would have been very happy to have gone on to Buffalo. But I needed the library at Yale, so I continued on to Yale. There were no radicals in the, in the graduate schools right, from 1968 to 72 when I was there. there only one radical, Todd Gitlin, okay, went on to have a career success. Okay. The, the actual radicals of the 1960s okay, either went off, dropped out of college and went off to create communes, right, or they were taking acid and destroyed their brains. Now, I, I have also written about that. The destruction of the, of the minds okay, of the most talented members of my generation through LSD. It was going on all around me. Right? So, so what's, what's happened is the actual legacy of the 60s got truncated. The idea that these post-structuralists and post-modernists are heirs of the 1960s revolution is an absolute crock. Okay? What they represent, as Foucault shows, shows Foucault said okay, that the biggest influence on, on his thinking okay, was Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, okay, which was a post-World War II play uh, written in Paris that was about the disillusionment and nihilism experienced after Hitler went through, occupied France, right, and all of Europe was in ruins. It had nothing to do, the, the, what, what's in Waiting for Godot has nothing to do with the authentic legacy of the 1960s, which was about genuine multiculturalism, a movement toward India, toward Hinduism, a, a transformation of consciousness through psychedelics, which I, I did not take, but which I identify with totally through the music, etc. Right? It was a turn toward the body. It was a turn toward sensory experience, okay? not this, this word chopping thing and this like cynical removal from actual in, in experience. Right? That French import okay, came in okay, to the graduate schools. It did not affect any genuine 1960s person. The real 1960s revolution was about Jung. It was about an, an, a way of seeing the cosmos in mythological terms. Right? And the Jungian contribution went on into the New Age movement of, of the 1970s. A Aside from the universities. Right? So who took over the universities were these careerists. Okay? I saw them with my own eyes. I saw what happened. I, saw, I was at Yale when Derrida was being shipped over okay, to, to, to address 
the, uh, you know, the, the students, the grad students, and, and the faculty. And I, and I said to a fellow student after hearing one of these guys speak, it wasn't Derrida, it was, uh, it was a, a, another one of the theorists. I said, they are like high priests murmuring to each other. All right. this, this was an elitist form from the start. Okay? It was not progressive, it was not revolutionary, it was reactionary. It was a desperate attempt to hold on to what had happened before the 1960s century revolution. So, but this postmodernist thing, okay, this trashing okay, of, of the text, this, this, this encouragement okay, of a superior and destructive attitude toward the work of art. We're going through it okay, primly with red pen in hand, finding all the evidence of sexism, check, racism, check, homophobia, check. That is not the empathic, emotional, okay, sensory-based okay, revolution of the 1960s. Right? I am sick and tired of these people claiming any kind of mantle from the 1960s. They're frauds. These people are, what happened in the 1960s, 70s was a collapse of the job market in, in, in academe. Okay? All, all of a sudden the jobs were scarce and this thing was there, the new and improved and shiny thing okay, to be a theorist. Okay? People seized on it, okay? it was institutionalized, right? and I, it's an enormous betrayal of the 1960s. Okay, so that you, you touched on this idea of the destruction of the work of art. You know, and, and one of the things I really liked about reading Nietzsche was his discussion of resentment, right, of resentment. And, and it seems to me that a tremendous amount of the motive power that drives the postmodernist, let's call it, it's not a revolution, uh, um, transformation, seems to me to be driven by resentment about virtually anything that has any, well, what would you say, any merit of competence or aesthetic quality. And I don't know if that's, it seems to me that that's partly rooted in the academics' disdain for the business world, which I think is driven by their relative economic inequality, because most people who are as intelligent as academics are, from a pure IQ point of view, make more money in the private sphere. And so I think that drives some of it. But there also seems to be this, there's a destruction, an aim for destruction of the, of the aesthetic quality of the, of the literary or artistic work. It's reduction to nothing but some kind of power game. And then in, in, surrounding that, the reduction of everything to something that approximates a power game, which, which I can't help but identifying with, with jealousy and resentment as a, as a fundamental motivator. Does that seem reasonable to you? These professors okay, who allege that art is nothing okay, but an ideological movement by one uh, elite okay, uh, 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 against, the <laughs> against another group. Right? These people are Philistines. Okay? They're Philistines. They're middle brow, hopelessly middle brow. Okay? They, they, they have no sense of beauty. They have no sense of the aesthetic. Now, Marxism does indeed assert this. Okay? Marxism tries to reconfigure the universe in terms of materialism. It, sees it, it, it does not recognize any kind of spiritual Dimension. Now, I'm an atheist, but I see the great world religions as enormous works of, of art, okay? mm -hmm. as, the, as, the, as the best way to understand the universe and man's place in it. I, I find them enormously moving. They're, 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 they're like enormous poems. Right? They're, they're, and I, and I, what I have called for, the true revolution, okay, would have been okay, to make the core curriculum of world education, the world, okay, the great religions of the world. I feel that is the only way to achieve an understanding, and it's also a way to to um, to present the aesthetic. Okay, because I, I feel that that the, that the real '60s vision was about exaltation, elevation, cosmic consciousness. Okay, I, all of these things okay, were, were rejected. Okay, by these by these midgets. Okay, intellectual midgets who seized on to Lacan, Derrida, and Foucault. Right, it's an and I, I, my career has been in the art schools. So my, 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 my entire career, beginning at Bennington College. Right? Uh, so I, I represent a challenge for this from the perspective of art. Okay? It is an absolute nonsense, okay, as post-structuralism maintains, that reality is mediated by language, by words, everything that we can know, including gender. It's absolutely madness, because I, I'm teaching students whose majors are ceramics, okay, or dance, okay, who are, who are jazz musicians, who understand reality in terms of the body, of right. sensory acti activation. Okay? So they, now, they, what, see, what happened was something was going on in the art world as well. I identify with Andy Warhol in pop art. Okay, that was what was going on during you know, my years in college. Everything about Andy Warhol was like, wow, 
admiration. Wow. What happened immediately after that in the arts, 1970s, okay, was this collapse into a snide sort of postmodernism also. This happened in the art world, all right? All right? And, and it was a, a, an utter misunderstanding okay, of culture, it seems to me, by that movement in, in, in the art world. That is, uh, oppositional art, in my view, is dead, okay? It's been, in, in this, in what postmodernism is, is not it a pathetic attempt to continue the old heroism of the avant-garde. The avant-garde was just genuinely heroic from the early 19th century, okay, where we're talking about, you know, whether Courbet, the realists, you know, we're talking about Monet and the Impressions, people who genuinely suffered for their radical ideas, their, new, their innovations, and so on, right? Going right down to, to, to Picasso and down to, uh, to Jackson Pollock, who, like, was, who, who truly suffered, okay, for, you know, for his art. It was only after his death, okay, that suddenly the market was created for abstract art. Pop art killed the avant-garde. The idea that the avant-garde continues is an absolute delusion of the contemporary art world, you know, which feels that it must attack, 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 challenge. Okay, the the, the simplistic beliefs of the of the hoi polloi. Okay, it's, it's somehow the art. What? Excuse me. Okay, from the moment. Okay, Andy Warhol went through and embraced. Uh, the popular media, in, in, instead of having the opposition to it, the serious artists have had. Okay, that was the end of oppositional art. Okay, so we have been going on now for 50 years. The postmodernism in academia is hand in hand with with the stupidity and infantilism that masquerades as you know as as important art at galleries everywhere. This incredible, incredible you know it's mechanism of, of contemporary art, you know, pushing things that are that are so hopelessly derivative that that are, and, and with this idea that once again that the art world somehow has a superior view of reality. The authentic leftism is populist, okay? It is based in working class style, working class language, working class direct emotion, a, 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 an openness and brusqueness of speech, okay? Not this fancy contorted jargon of the pseudo leftists of academe who are frauds. These people, these people who manage to, manage to rise to the top at, at, at Berkeley, at Harvard, at Princeton, okay? The idea that these people are radical, they are career people, they're core Corporate types, okay, who like who succeeded in, and they love the institutional context. They they know how to manipulate the bureaucracy, which has totally invaded and usurped, okay, the you know the and academe everywhere, okay. These people are company pl players. They could have done well in any any field, okay. They they love to sit in endless committees. They love bureaucratic regulation and so on. There's not one not one leftist, okay, in American academe raised his or her voice against the obscene gro growth of tuition costs. Which have bankrupted a whole generation of young people. Not not one voice, okay, to challenge the, that, that that invasion by the bureaucrats, okay, absolute fascist bureaucrats, okay, who have, who have added. They're like a they're cancerous, okay. They, there's so many of them. They've, they've the faculty have completely lost any power in American mm -hmm. academia, yeah. okay. It's a it's a scandal what has happened, okay. And, and they deserve the present servitude that they're in right now, okay, because they never protested. Okay? Yes. My, when I my first job at Bennington College, 1976, I was there when there was an uprising by the faculty against encroachment by the B board of trustees and the president okay and, and it was a huge thing it was it was it was reported on the new york times and so on and we and we pushed that president out okay and and there's not been a single uprising of that kind against against encroachment by the trustees and by the administrations and all these decades okay passive slaves slaves they deserve their slavery yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, and I've thought the same thing about university professors for a long time, is that they get exactly what they deserve yes. because they never stand up and say no. Mm -hmm. And the fact that in the United States, it's not quite as bad in Canada, I wouldn't say, but the fact that the students have been essentially handed a bill of indentured servitude here for their student loans is absolutely beyond comprehension. You know, it seems to me that the bureaucracy has basically conspired to determine how to pick the pockets of the students' future earnings, right? Mm -hmm. And they do that by offering them an extended adolescence with no quality control, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's a real bargain with the devil. And, and a total abandonment of any kind of education, actually, in history and culture. Right, there's, there's, it's gone along with it. That is the, tra the, the transformation into a cafeteria kind of a menu. Okay, we can pick this course or that course or this course without any kind of guidance from the university about a central core curriculum that teaches you history and chronology yeah. and introduces you to the basics. Right? Because because oh, we have, well, because our, our professor.
professors are, are such prima donnas, they can only teach in their little areas. So we have this total fragmentation. Okay? The, the, the great art history survey courses are being abandoned steadily. Okay? Because Why? Because graduate students are not trained to see the great narratives, the nar we, because we are taught now that narratives are false. Okay, okay? so that's another issue ah. that I'd like to bring up, because one of the things I cannot figure out mm -hmm. is the alliance between the postmodernists and the neo-Marxists. I can't understand the causal relationship there because the, the, the f tell me if you disagree with this, okay, because um, I'm a psychologist, not a sociologist, and so I'm dabbling in things that are outside of my field of expertise, and there is some danger in that, but the, cent the central postmodernist claim seems to me that because there's a near infinite number of ways to interpret a complex set of phenomena, which, which actually happens to be the case, that you can't make a case that any of those modes of interpretation are canonical. And so if they're not canonical, if that, and if that canonical element isn't based in some kind of reality, then it serves some other master. And so the master that it hypothetically serves for the postmodernists is nothing but power, because that seems to be everything that they believe in. They don't believe in competence. They don't believe in authority. They don't seem to believe in an objective world, because everything is language mediated. Right. So it's an extraordinarily cynical perspective yes. that that because there's an infinite number of interpretations, none of them are canonical, you can attribute it everything to power and dominance. Okay, so that, does that seem like a reasonable summary of the yes, postmodern? Yes, exactly. Okay. So it's, a, it's a radical relativism. Okay, it's a radical relativism. Mm -hmm. Now, but the strange thing is, despite, okay, and so what goes along with that is the demolition of grand narratives. And so that would be associated, for example, with the rejection of thinkers like Jung and Eric Neumann, because of course they're foundational thinkers. Um, in relationship to the idea that there are embodied grand narratives. That's never touched. But then, despite the fact that the grand narrative is rejected, there's a neo-Marxism that's tightly, tightly allied with postmodernism that also seems to shade into this strange identity politics. And I don't, two things, I don't understand the causal relationship there. Like the, the skeptical part of me thinks that postmodernism was, was an intellectual, it's intellectual camouflage for the continuation of the kind of pathological Marxism that produced the Soviet Union, and that has no independent existence as an intellectual field whatsoever. But I still can't understand how the postmodernists can make the no grand narrative claim, but then immerse themselves in this grand narrative without anyone pointing out the evident contradictions. Like, I don't understand that. So what do you think about that? Well, I can only speak about literary you know, professors, really. And they seem to me, almost universally in the US, to be very naive. They, they, know not, they seem to know nothing about actual history, political science, or economics. So it, it, it is simply an attitude. They have an attitude. It, it, Marxism becomes simply a badge by which they telegraph their, um, their solidarity with a working class that they have nothing to do with, right? I mean, the, the, and generally nothing but contempt. Yes, and, and, the, and the thing is that, that the, the, the campus leftists are almost notorious okay, for, their, uh, for their rather snobbish treatment of staff. I mean, they don't, they don't have any rapport with the actual working class members of the, um, you know, of the, of the infrastructure, the, janitor, the janitors, and, the, you know, and, and even, the, even the secretaries. There's a kind of high and mighty uh, aristocracy. You know, about, they were, these, are just, these are people who, um, who have wandered into the English department. Right? And are, were products of a time when, um, uh, during the, the new criticism, okay, when, when history, both history and psychology had been excluded. Right? I mean, my ambition okay, was, I mean, I love the new criticism okay, as, a, as a style of textual analysis. Right? And, and, the, and the new criticism had multiple interpretations okay, that were possible okay, and, that, and that were encouraged. In fact, one of the, you know, one of the great projects was Made in Max, a series, 20th Century Views, where, where you had at least books, I adored them in college. It was about Jane Austen or about you know, Emily Bronte or about um, Wordsworth, and they were collections of alternate views of the same thing. The idea that there were no alternate views and, and there was no relativistic, you know, situational kind, kind of an interpretive approach is nonsense. Okay? But the point was, we needed to restore okay, history to literary, literary study, okay? and we needed to add psychology to it because it was, there was great animus against Freud. When I arrived in, in graduate school, in fact, I actually went into 
actually director of graduate studies, and protested the way Freud and Freudian were used as, as negative terms okay, in a sneering way by the very WASP professors. Right? So we needed to have, and actually it seemed like we were moving there. Okay? In the early 1970s was a great period of psychobiography about, great, about political figures. Okay? And so I thought it's happening. This year. And all of a sudden it all got short circuited by this arrival you know, of, of post structuralism and post modernism in the, in the, in the 1970s. Right. Um, so I, 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 I feel I'm an old historicist, okay? not, not a new historicist, so I think, I think new historicism is an absolute scam. Right? It, it, and it's, like, it's just a, a way, it's like tweezers, you, like just, you, just, you pick a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, you make a little tiny salad, okay? and, and somehow this atomized thing okay, is supposed to mean something. It's all to me very superficial, very cynical, uh, very distant. I, like, I, I, am a, I am the product okay, of old historicism, of German philology. I decided my, my first uh, choice of a profession when I was a child would, was Egyptology, archaeology. So I'm, I'm, everything I ever think about or say is, is related to an enormous time scheme okay, from, from antiquity and indeed from the Stone Age. Right? And that is the problem with, with these people. They're, they're maleducated, the postmodernists and academic Marxists okay, are maleducated, embarrassingly so. Okay? They know nothing before the present. Right. Foucault okay, is absolutely a joke before the Enlightenment. Okay? I mean, per perhaps he might be useful to people to talk about what happened af after neoclassicism, which by the way he failed to notice. Okay? Right? A lot of what he was talking about okay, turns out to see be simply the hangover of neoclassicism. Okay? This, this is how ignorant that man was. I mean, he's, he, was, he was not talented as a researcher. He knew absolutely nothing. Okay, was so, he knew nothing about antiquity. How can you make any kind of large <laughs> structure, um, large mechanism, you know, to analyze Western culture without knowing about classical antiquity? Okay, he, he did not see anything. He, this was a person who had no business making large theoretical statements about anything. Well, may, maybe part of it is that if you if you generate an intelligible doctrine of radical relativism then there is no reason to assume that there are distinctions between categories of knowledge or between different levels of quality of knowledge, right? So I've seen the same thing in, in the psychology departments, although we have the, uh, what would you call it, the luxury of being bounded at least to some degree by the empirical method and by biology, right? It's one of the things that keeps most of the branches of psychology relatively mm -hmm. sane, you know, because the real world is actually built into it to some degree. but. If you accept the postmodernist claim of radical relativism, then you completely demolish the idea that there are quality levels that are associated with education because everything becomes the same. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable justification for maintaining ignorance. You know, like Foucault, I actually found him the most readable of the Lacan, Derrida, Foucault triad. You can read Foucault. I read Madness and Civilization and a couple of his other books, and I thought that they were painfully obvious. You know, the idea that mental disorder is in part a social construct is self-evident to anybody who has even a smattering of psychiatric training. I mean, the, the real narrow medical types tend to, to think of a, 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 a me mental disorder, let's say, as something that might be purely biological. They have a pure disease model, but nobody who's a sophisticated thinker ever thinks that. It's a, partly because medicine is a brand of engineering, not a brand of science, because it's associated with health. And the diagnostic categories are hybrids between physiological observation and sociocultural condition. Everyone knows that. And so when I read Madness and Civilization, I thought, well, that's not radical. That's just bloody self-evident. But Well, you know, Foucault's admirers actually think that he began, you know, the entire turn toward toward a sociological, uh, you know, grounding of, of modern psychology. The social psychology was was well well launched in the 1920s, for example. You know, for, right. I mean, the, the levels of ignorance of these the, these people who think Foucault is so original have not read Durkheim, they've not read Max Weber, they've not read Irving Goffman. Okay, so in other words, all, to, to me, for, for everything in Foucault seemed obvious. Okay, because I had read the sources from which he was borrowing without attribution. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so again, I I know these people. I mean, I, I've met. I mean, in some cases, you know, knew them in graduate school. People who went on to become these 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 admirers of Foucault, Lacan, Derrida, and I know what their training was. Their training was purely within the English department. That's all they ever knew. They never made any research outside of that, right? And so, so the idea, so, the, so the, Foucault is simply this ease, a mechanism. It's like a, a little tiny kit by which they can approach everything in culture, and then and then the but the contortions of language, the deliberate labyrinth.
Corinthian elitist language at the same time as pretending to be a leftist, okay, this is a, one of the biggest frauds ever practiced. So I got a story to tell you that you might like because I've thought a lot about that use of language, you know, because language can be used as camouflage. And so here's the story. I think I got this from Robert Sapolsky. So he was talking about zebras and Zebras, of course, have stripes, and hypothetically, that's associated with camouflage. But it's, it's not a straightforward association because zebras are black and white, and they're on the veldt along with the lions. The lions are camouflaged because they're grass-colored, but the bloody zebras are black and white. You can see them like 15 miles away. So, okay, so biologists go out to study zebras, and they're like making notes on a zebra, and they watch it, and then they look down at their notes, and then they look up, and they think, uh-oh, oh, I don't know which zebra I was looking at. So the camouflage is actually against the herd because a zebra is a herd animal, not an individual. And so the black and white stripes break up the animal against the herd, so you can't identify it. So this was a quandary for the biologists, so they did one of two things. One was drive a jeep up to the, to the zebra herd and use a dab of red paint and dab the haunch of the zebra or tag it with an ear tag like you use for cattle. The lions would kill it. So as soon as it became identifiable, the yes, the predators could organize their hunt around that identifiable animal. That's why, you know, there's the old idea that lions and predators take down the weak animals, but they don't. They take down the identifiable animals. So that's the thing, is if you stick your damn head up, you get picked off by the predators. And so one of the things that academics seem to do is congregate together in herd-like entities, and then they share a language, right? Yes. And the language unites them, mm -hmm. and also keeps them, as long as they share the same set of linguistic tools among themselves, they know that there isn't anybody in the, in the coterie that's going to attack them or de destabilize the entire herd. And that seems to me to account for that impenetrable use of language. It's, it's, it's group protection strategy, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the search for it's the search for security within a system and not the desire to expand the system. So, so true. But to me, it's blatantly careerist because it, it, was, it was about advancement and it was also about the claim that somehow they have like special expertise. This is a special technical language. No one else can understand it. Only, only we can. But what's absurd about it, absolutely ludicrous, all right, is that these people, these, these American academics, are imitating the contorted language of French uh, translations from the French, okay? When Lacan is translated, translated into, into English, right? There's a contortion there, okay? What, he's, what, he, what he was trying to do in French was to break up, okay, the neoclassical formulations that descended from Racine. There was something that was going on, there was a sabotage of the French language going on that was necessary in France, not necessary in English. We, we have this long tradition of poetry going back to, to Shakespeare and Chaucer. We have, we have our own language, far more vital than the, than the French. Oh uh, yeah, the French constrain their language all the time. Yes, sir. By, by the, the, absurd, the absurdity in the amateurism okay, of, of American academics okay, trying to imitate okay, a, a, a translation of Lacan okay, when Lacan is doing something in France that is absolutely not necessary and indeed wrong to be doing in English. All right? so the, 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 the utter cynical abandonment okay, of the great tradition of, 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 you know, of, of the English departments. Right? And I, I, I felt that the true radicalism was not about adding on other departments. Okay, so we have African American studies and you know and, and and women's studies and so on. The true radicalism would be, have been to to shatter the departmental structure. That's what I wanted. I feel that was the authentic revolutionary 1960s thing to do, right? To 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 blend all the liter literature study, you know, studies together, okay? To, so to to make easier to make an interdisciplinary kind of organization, uh, you know, closer to the British model where a person can pursue related subjects, overlapping subjects. Uh, they, they, these 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 departmental models, okay, are were, were to me totalitarian to begin with. Okay, separating language into fiefdoms, okay? and and what what this did to, to create uh, English uh, women's studies department absolutely out, out of the air. Just snap your fingers and create women's studies. The English department had taken a century to develop. Okay, the way it, it was yeah. a huge argument. Okay, within with, within it, right? And all of a sudden to create okay a, a department with a politicized agenda from the start. Okay, by people without any training whatever in that field. Okay, what should be the what should be the parameters of the field? What should be the requirements? that field. How about biology, okay, if you're going to be discussing gender, that should have been a number one requirement, okay, as part of any women's studies department or program. Yes. But no, okay, it was all hands off. It was just the administrators wanted to solve a public relations problem, okay. They had a situation with very few women faculty, 
uh, 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 nationwide at a time when the women's movement had, had just started up. The spotlight of attention was, was on them. They, want, they needed women faculty fast. They needed the, the women's subject on the agenda fast. Right? So they just like, poof, let there be women's studies. Okay? And now we'll just hire some women, usually from English departments, you know, here, here, here and there, and we'll just throw them together. You invent it. You say what it is. So that's why women's studies got frozen at a certain point of ideology okay, of the early 1970s. I was already in revolt from it. Okay? I, I was a precursor in terms of my endorsement of feminism before, before even now was created. Right? But I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even have a, a conversation with any of these women. They were hysterical about the subject of biology. They knew yeah. nothing about hormones. Okay? I mean, I, I, I probably got in fist fights over this. They, people were so convinced that biology had nothing whatever to do with gender differences. Right? See, that also seems to me to be related to the postmodern emphasis on power. Yes. Because there's, a, there's something terrible underground going on there, and that is, and I, I think this is the sort of thing that was reflected in the Soviet Union too, in the, especially in the 20s when there was this idea, a radical idea, that you could remake human beings entirely, right? Because they had no essential nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if your fundamental hypothesis is that nothing exists except power, and you believe that, then that also gives you the right, in some sense, to exercise your power at the creation of the kind of humanity that your utopian vision envisions. And then that has no, that, and that also seems to me to justify the postmodern insistence that everything is only a linguistic construct. It again goes down to the notion of power which Derrida and Foucault and Lacan are so bloody obsessed with. Mm -hmm. And so and it seems to me what they're trying to do is to, to take all the potential power for the creation of human beings to themselves without any bounding conditions whatsoever, right? There's no history, there's no biology, there's, and, and everything is a fluid culture that can be manipulated at will. And so, I mean, in, in Canada, there are terrible arguments right now about biological essentialism, let's say, and, and one of the things that happened, which was something I objected to precisely a year ago, is that the social constructionist view of human identity has been built now into Canadian law. So there's an insistence that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual proclivity vary independently with no causal relationship between any of the levels. Mm -hmm. And so that's in the law, and not only is it in the law, it's being taught everywhere. It's being taught in the armed forces, it's being taught in the police, it's being taught to the elementary school kids and the junior high school kids. And underneath it all, I see this terrible striving for arbitrary power that's associated with this crazy utopianism. And, 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 but I still don't exactly understand it. I don't, like, I don't understand that, what seems to be the hatred that motivates it that you see bubbling up, for example, in identity politics and, and in the desire to do nothing but, let's say, demolish the patriarchy. It kind of reminds me, and this is something else I wanted to talk to you about, you know, in, you're, you're an admirer of Eric Neumann and of yes. Carl Jung. Yeah, and that's, the Neumann connection is really interesting because I think he's a bloody genius. Yes. I really like The Great Mother is a great book and a really a great warning, that book, and also The Origins and History of Consciousness. Is, one of my, is, one of my most influential books, yeah. Yeah, well, that's so interesting. Yeah. I read an essay yeah. that you wrote. I, I don't remember when it the was. The lecture I gave on Neumann at the NYU, yes. Yes, it's always been staggering to me that that book hasn't had the impact that it should have had. I mean, Jung himself, in the preface to that book, wrote that that was the book that he wished that he would have written. It's very much associated with Jung's Symbols of Transformation, and it was a major impact influence on my book Maps of Meaning, which was an attempt to outline the universal archetypes that, that are portrayed in the kind of religious structures that you, that you put forward. But the thing that I really see happening, and you can tell me what you think about this, in, in Neumann's book, consciousness, which is masculine, symbolically masculine for a variety of reasons, is, is viewed as rising up uh, against the countervailing force of tragedy from an underlying feminine, symbolically feminine unconsciousness, right? And it's something that can always be pulled back into that unconsciousness. That would be the microcosm of that would be the Freudian Oedipal mother familial dynamic where the mother is so over uh, protective and all encompassing that she interferes with the development of the competence not only of her sons but also of her daughters, of her children in general. And it seems to me that that's the dynamic that's being played out in our society right now, is that there's this, and it's, it's related in some way that I don't understand to this, to this insistence that all forms of masculine authority are nothing but tyrannical power. So the symbolic representation is tyrannical father with no appreciation for the benevolent father and benevolent mother with no appreciation whatsoever for the tyrannical mother, right? And that's that, 
And because I thought of ideologies as fragmentary mythologies. That's where they get their archetypal and psychological power, right? And so in a balanced representation, you have the terrible mother and the great mother, as, as Neumann laid out so nicely. And you have the terrible father and the great father. So that's the fact that culture mangles you half to death while it's also promoting you and developing you. You have to see that as balanced. And then you have the heroic and adversarial individual. But in the postmodern world, and this seems to be something that's increasingly seeping out into the culture at large, you have nothing but the tyrannical father, nothing but the destructive force of masculine consciousness, and nothing but the benevolent benevolent great mother. And it's, a, it's an appalling ideology. And it seems to me that it's sucking the vitality, which, which is exactly what you would expect symbolically. It's sucking the vitality out of our culture. You see that with the increasing demolition of, of young men, um, and not only young men, in terms of their academic performance, which like they're falling way behind in elementary school, way behind in junior high, and bailing out of the universities like mad. And so, and I, I well, the public school education has become completely permeated uh, by this kind of uh, anti-male propaganda. I mean, in, I, to me, public schools are just a form of imprisonment, you know, right now. Mm -hmm. They're particularly destructive to young men who have a lot of physical energy, okay? Uh, yeah, now, you know, I identify as transgender, okay, my, myself, okay, but I do, not, uh, I do not require the entire world to alter itself, okay, to, to fit my particular self-image. I, I do believe in uh, the power of hormones. I believe that men exist in Women exist, and they are biologically different. I think that I think there is no cure for um, the culture's ills right now, except if men start standing up okay, and demanding that they be respected as men again. Okay, okay. So I got a question about that. So, so one of the things we did a research project a year ago trying to figure out if there was such a thing as political correctness from a psychometric perspective to find out if. The, the loose ag aggregation of beliefs actually clumped together statistically. And we actually found two factors, which I won't go into. But then we looked at things that predicted adherence to that, that uh, politically correct creed. And there were a couple that were surprising. One was being female was a predictor. The personality attributes associated with femininity, so that would be agreeableness and higher levels of negative emotion, were also both independent predictors. But so were symptoms of personality disorder which I thought was really important because part of what I see happening is that like, I think that women whose relationship with men have, has been seriously pathologized cannot distinguish between male authority and competence and male tyrannical power. Mm -hmm. Like they fail to differentiate because all they see is the oppressive male. Mm -hmm. and, and they may have had experiences that, that um, their experiences with men might have been rough enough so that that differentiation never occurred because it, it has to occur and you have to have a lot of experience with men and good men too before that will occur but it seems to me that we're also increasingly dominated by a view of masculinity that's mostly characteristic of women who have terrible personality disorders and who are unable to have healthy relationships with men now but here's the problem you know this is something my wife has pointed out too. She said, well, men are gonna to have to stand up for themselves, but here's the problem. I know how to stand up to a man who's, who's uh, unfairly trespassing against me. And the reason I know that is because the parameters for my resistance are quite well defined, which is we talk, we argue, we push, and then it becomes physical. Right, like if, if we move beyond the boundaries of civil discourse, we know what the next step is. Okay, that's forbidden in, in discourse with women. And so I don't think that men can control crazy women. I don't think, I really don't believe it. I think that they have to throw their hands up in, 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 in what, in, in, it's not even disbelief. It's that the cultural, there's no step forward that you can take under those circumstances because if the man is offensive enough and crazy enough, the, the re reaction becomes physical right away or at least the threat is there. And when men are talking to each other in any serious manner, that underlying threat of physicality is always there, especially if it's a real conversation and keeps the thing civilized to some degree. You know, if you're talking to a man who wouldn't fight with you under any circumstances whatsoever, then you're talking to someone to whom you have absolutely no respect. But I can't see any way. For example, there's a, there's a woman in, in Toronto who's been uh, organizing this movement, let's say, against me and some other people who are going to do a free speech um, um, event. And she managed to organize quite effectively. And she's quite um, 
offensive, you might say. She compared us to Nazis, for example, which, you know, publicly, yeah. using the swastika, which wasn't really something I was all that fond of. But I, I'm defenseless against that kind of female insanity because the techniques that I would use against a man who was employing those tactics are forbidden to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Like, it seems to me that it isn't men that have to stand up and say enough of this, even though that is what they should do. It seems to me that it's sane women who have to stand up against their crazy sisters and say, look, enough of that, enough man-hating, enough pathology, enough bringing disgrace on us as a, as a gender. But the problem there, and, and then I'll stop my little tirade, is that most of the women I know who are sane are busy doing sane things, right? They're off, they have their career, they have their family, they're quite occupied, and they don't seem to have the time or maybe even the interest to go after their, their crazy harpy sisters. And so I don't see any regulating force for that, that terrible femininity. And it seems to me to be invading the culture and undermining the, the masculine power of the culture in a way that's, I think, fatal. I really do believe that. I, I, too, I too believe that these are, these are symptomatic of the decline of Western culture, and it, we, and, and it will just go down flat. I don't think people realize that you know, the, the masculinity still exists okay, in the world as a code among jihadists. Okay? And, yes. and when you have passionate masculinity okay, circling the borders like the Huns and the Vandals during the Roman Empire, that, that's what I see. I see this culture rotting from within okay, and, and disemboweling itself, literally. Now, I have an overview of, of why we're having these problems. Right? And it, it comes from the fact that I'm the product of an immigrant family. All four of my grandparents and my mother were born in, in Italy. So I remember from my earliest years in this factory town in upstate New York where the, my, my relatives came to work in the shoe factory, I can remember still, okay, the, the life of the agrarian era, okay, which, were not, which was for most of human history, okay, uh, the agrarian era, where there was the world of men and the world of women. And the sexes had very little to do with each other. Each had power and status in its own realm. Right? And, and, they, and they laughed at each other, in, in essence. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. the, the women had enormous power. In fact, the old women ruled, not the young, beautiful women like today. Okay? But the, the, the older you were, the more you had control over everyone, including the mating and marriage. Um, you, they, there were no doctors, so, the, the, so you had the, you know, the, the old women were like midwives and knew all the ins and outs of this inherited knowledge about pregnancy and all, all these other things. Right? I can remember this, this and, and the joy that women had with each other. All all day long, okay, cooking with each other, you know, companions to each other, talking, conversing. My mother remembered as a small child in Italy when it was time to do the laundry. They would take the laundry up the mount, up the hill to the fountain, il sorgo, okay, and, and do it by hand. They would sing, they would picnic, and so on. All right, and we, we get a glimpse of that in the Odyssey when Odysseus is is, is thrown up naked on the shores of Phaeacia, all right, and and he hears the, the sound of, of of women, young women laughing and singing, and it's not. Zikia, the princess, bringing the women to do the laundry. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there was a, each, each gender had its own hierarchy, its own values, its own way of talking, and the sexes rarely intersected. Like I can remember in my in childhood, on a holiday, typical, it could, it could be a Christmas, it could be a Thanksgiving, whatever, all every, the women would be cooking all day long, everyone would sit down to eat, okay, and then after that, okay, the women would retire en masse to the kitchen, and the men would go, I would, I would would look at the window and see all the men. The men would be all outside, usually gather around the car, okay, mm -hmm. at a time when cars didn't work as well as they do today, with the hood up, okay, and right. the men would be standing with their hands on their hips like that, everyone staring at the engine. Okay? And I went, yeah, that's how I learned, okay, men were re refreshing themselves by studying something technical and mechanical right. after being with the women, okay, you know, for during the dinner, okay, and so on. So, uh, so all of these problems of today are the direct consequence of women's emancipation and freedom from the housework thanks to capitalism, okay, which made it possible for women to have jobs outside the home for the very first time in the 19th century, no longer to be dependent on, on a husband or father or brother, right? And so this great great thing that's happened to us, that allowing us to be totally self-supporting independent agents, has produced all this animosity about between men and women because the women, women feel unhappy. Women today, wherever I go, whether it's Italy or Brazil or England or America, okay, or Toronto, okay, the, 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 the 
the upper middle class professional women are unhappy, miserable. They want, and they don't know what, why they're unhappy. They want to blame it on men, okay? The men must change. Men must become more like women. No, that is the wrong way to go, okay? It's when men are men, okay? And understand themselves as men, are secure as men. Then you're going to be happier. Yeah, but, well, there's but, nothing more dangerous than a weak man. Yeah, absolutely, okay? And especially all these quizzlings, okay? Spouting feminist rhetoric yeah, when okay. I hear that. Okay, I mean, it makes me sick. But here's the point. Men and women have never work side by side, ever. Maybe on the farms, okay, when you were like, maybe one person's in the potato field, the other one's over here in the tomato, doing tomatoes, or whatever, okay? You, 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 had, you had families working, working side by side, exhausted with each other, no time to have a, any clash of this. It was a collaborative effort on, on farms and so on. Never in all of human history have men and women been working side by side. And women are now the pressure about Silicon Valley. They're also sexist. Oh, they're, they're, they don't allow women in and so on. The Men are being men in Silicon Valley, all right, and so on. And the Especially women, the engineers. And the women are demanding that, you're, oh, this is terrible, you're being sexist. Maybe the sexes, okay, have their own particular form of rhetoric, their own particular form of, you know, of identity, okay? Maybe, okay, we need to re-examine, re, re okay, this business about, you know, they, they, maybe we have to perhaps accept some degree of tension and conflict between the sexes, okay, in, in a work environment. I don't mean harassment. I'm talking, I'm talking about women feeling disrespective. How somehow they, with their opinions when they express them, okay, are not taken seriously, or or, the, the, or, or even Hillary Clinton is complaining. Oh, when a mm -hmm. woman, woman writes something online, she's attacked immediately, and so on. Well, everyone's attacked online. What are you talking about? The world is tough. The world is competitive. Okay, identity is honed. Okay, by conflict. The idea that there should be no conflict, that we have to be in this bath, okay, of approbation. Yes. And, 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 you know, it, 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 which is which is well, just, that's the it, devouring mother. That's right. It's absolutely infantile. I mean, okay, so a couple of things there. Well, the first thing is, is that, that the agreeableness trait that divides men and women most, there's three things that divide women and men most particularly from the psychometric perspective. One is that women are more agreeable than men. And so that seems to be the primary maternal dimension as far as I can tell. It's associated with um, a desire to avoid conflict, but it's, it's associated with interpersonal closeness, compassion, politeness. Women are reliably higher than men, especially in the Scandinavian countries and, and in the countries where egalitarianism has progressed the farthest. So that's where the, the difference is maximized, which is one of the things James Damore pointed out quite correctly in his infamous Google memo. Okay, women are higher in negative emotion, so that's anxiety and emotional pain. That, that difference is approximately the same size. And again, that maximizes in egalitarian societies, which is extremely interesting. And then the biggest difference is the difference in interest between people and things. And so women are more interested in people and men are more interested in things, which goes along quite nicely with your car anecdote. But the thing about men interacting with men, again, is that it isn't that they respect each other's viewpoints. That's not exactly right. What happens with a man, and, and I know a lot of men that I would regard as, as remarkably tough people for, for one reason or another, and everything you do with them is a form of combat. Like, if you want your viewpoint taken seriously, often you have to yell them down. And, and like, they're not going to stop talking unless you start talking over them. You know? And it's, it's not like men are automatically giving respect to other men, because that just doesn't happen. It's that the combat is there, and it's expected. And one of the problems, and, and so this is part of the reason why I think men are bailing out of, of so much of academia, and, and, and maybe the academic world in general, and maybe the world in general, is that men actually don't have any idea how to compete with women. Because the problem is, is that if you unleash yourself completely, then you're an absolute bully. And there's no doubt about that. Because if men unleash themselves on other men, that can be pretty goddamn brutal, especially for the men that are really tough. And this, so that just doesn't happen with women ever. But so you can't unleash yourself completely. If you win, you're a bully. If you lose, well, you're just bloody pathetic. So how the hell are you supposed to play a game like that? Mm -hmm. You know, so in, I've worked with lots of women in law firms in, in, in Canada, for example, and, and high-achieving women, like really remarkable people, I would say. And they're often nonplussed, I would say, by the attitude of the men in the law firm because they would like to see everyone pulling together because they're all part of the same team. Whereas the men are like at each other's throats in, an, in a cooperative way because they want the law firm to succeed, but they want to be the person who's at the top of the success hierarchy, right? So, and that, that doesn't jive well with the more competitive or cooperative ethos that's part and parcel of agreeableness. And so 
We don't really have any idea how to integrate male and female dominance exactly. hierarchies. And exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. This is why I love this show, you know, Real Housewives, which, which is yes. which Boris Adams scorns. And just, just last night, okay, I was watching one, an episode right, where the, the women were at each other okay, at a party and, all, and, and, and recounting, but I said this to you, but you said this to me. And, and the men got, we got together there and said, well, this is the way they communicate you know, with each other. And, you know, said, and then, you know men, we, we men, okay, just will have a fist Fight, and, we'll, and, and 10 minutes later, we're going to have a beer at the bar with, next to each other. And, so, mm -hmm. and, and I, I have observed that my, my entire my, my daughter, life. My daughter used to be really irritated about that because she, she like most people, uh, was the target of feminine uh, conspiratorial bullying at one, she's no pushover, my daughter, so this, it wasn't like this was a continual thing or that she didn't know what to do about it, but she had observed these girls conspiring against her and then blackening her name on, on Facebook, which is part, of the, part and parcel of the typical female bullying routine, which is often reputation demolition, right? Yeah. That, there's a good yes. literature on that. And then she'd watch what would happen if my brother or my son would have a, a dispute with his friends, you know, and maybe they were drinking and there was a dispute. They'd have a fight and then the next day they were friends again. And that's another thing that's strange is that like men have a way of bringing a conflict to a head and resolving it, right? And that it isn't obvious to me that women have that same, perhaps you might call it a luxury, mm -hmm. but it's also the case that men don't know what to do when they get into a conflict with a woman because what the hell are you supposed to do, you know? Mostly what you're supposed to do is avoid it. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, I, I've seen, um, you know, I, I don't know whether this crosses into other countries, but that there's a certain kind of taunting and teasing that men and boys do with each other that toughens them, yes. okay, and, and where they don't, they don't take things seriously. But a girl's feelings become extremely hurt if she hears something that, that is very tough, you know, against, like sarcastic against her. So I, I mean, I do feel that there are profound differences between the sexes in, ter in terms of emotions, in terms of communication patterns. Uh, you know, my father used to say that he could never follow women's con conversations. He said, he said, he said, women don't even finish their finished sentences. The, the, the women n n understand immediately what the other woman is saying, okay? Uh, and uh, and um, the, in the way the women tend to, to be more interested or have, have been traditionally more interested in soap operas, it's not just that the women were home without jobs, it's that I, honestly, Honestly, I believe that soap opera does reflect, does mirror the way women talk to each other. There's these communication patterns that have been built up through women, the world of women, okay, which, which was, it made sense there was a division of labor, okay. It wasn't sexism against women that there was a division of labor. The men went off to hunt and did the dangerous things. The women stayed around the hearth because you had pregnant women, nursing women, older women, okay, they, they, they were cooking and so on. So I feel that these communication patterns that we're talking about have been built up, okay, over the centuries. I mean, the men had to toughen each other okay, to go out. To go out. You know, the hunting parties of Native Americans, you know, it would, they could be gone for two weeks and it, when, when the temperature was below zero. Okay, many of them died. Okay, you know, the, the idea that somehow, oh, any kind of separation of the sexes or, or different spheres of the sexes is inherently sexist. And, and, yeah, and inherently it, driven by wrong. a power dynamic. The answer to all of this, okay, that everything that we're talking about, okay, is education into early history, okay? And until you, until people understand the Stone Age, the nomadic period, the agrarian era, and, and, the, and how culture, how civilization built up, okay? In Mesopotamia, the great irrigation projects, where, or, in, or in Egypt, okay? Where you had for the first centralized government authority became necessary, okay? To master these, these um, you had a situation where environmentally, uh, you, know, uh, you know, difficult situation like the deserts of Mesopotamia or, or the, the peculiar character of, of Egyptian geography where you can only have a, a little tiny fertile line along the edges of the Nile, okay, an otherwise desert landscape. So the, the civilization and authority, okay, right, it's not necessarily about power grabbing but about organization to achieve something for the good of the people as a whole. We yes, you will see that. It. Well, that's exactly the symbolism and, of, and the, they, of they, the great by father. By reducing all hierarchy to, to power, okay, yep. and, and selfish power, okay, is, is, it is utterly naive, it's ignorant, right? So I, I say education has to be totally reconstituted, including public education, to begin in the most distant past. So, that, so our young people today, who know nothing about how the, how the world was created that they inhabit, okay, can understand, okay, what, what marvel 
capitalist, you know, technological yes. paradise they live in, and it's the product of capitalism, it's the pro product of individual innovation, it's the pro most of it's the product of, of, of a Western tradition that everyone wants to trash now, etc. If you begin in the past and show, and also talk about war, because, with the, because with the war is the one thing that wakes people up, okay, as, as we see. War and is the reality we principle. May see. Yes, okay, war is the reality principle. My um, father and all, and five of my uncles went to World War II, you know, and, and, and my, you know, my father was was part of the, the force that landed in Japan. Okay, uh, as a, you know, as a, he was a paratrooper, um, you know, at the, at the time of the Japanese surrender. Okay, and all, and, all, and, and my a couple of uncles got shot up and so on. When you have the reality of war, when people ex see the reality of the horrors of war, Berlin burned, okay, and, and, you know, to a, to a crisp and, and so on, uh, you know, starvation, all kind. Then you understand, okay, this marvelous mechanism that brings water, you know, to, to the to the kitchen, and you flip on a light, and the, elect like the electric the electricity. Kind I know, well, for me, like, and I suppose it's because I have somewhat of a depressive temperament. I mean, one thing that staggers me on a consistent basis is the fact that anything ever works. I mean, because it's so unlikely, you know, to, to, to be in a situation where our electronic communications work, where our, where our electric grid works, and it works all the time, right? It works 100% of the time. And the reason for that is that there are mostly men out there who are breaking themselves into pieces, repairing this thing, which just falls apart all the time. Absolutely. Right. I said this in the Monk debate, okay, in Toronto several years ago. I said that there's the invisible, all these, 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 you know, these elitist, you know, professors yeah. sneering at men. It's men who are maintaining everything around us. Okay, this, this invisible army, okay, which which feminists don't notice. Right, nothing would work. To or regard for the men. regard as oppressive, which no. is you know, and like a professor is someone who's standing on a hill surrounded by a wall, which is surrounded by another wall, which is surrounded by another wall. Like it's walls all the way down, who stands up there and says, I'm brave and independent. It's like you've got this protected area that's mm -hmm. so unlikely. It's so absolutely unlikely. Yes. And the fact that people aren't on their knees in gratitude all the time for the so fact that we have central heating and air conditioning and, and pure water and reliable food, it's just it's incredible. So, it it's is. Incredible. It's absolutely yes. unbelievable. I mean, the, people used to die for the, the water supply. Okay, with, with, it was contaminated with cholera, for heaven's sakes. Right? People don't understand. Okay, they had to have clean water, and fresh milk, fresh orange juice, all of these things. These are marvelous. And all of the time. All of the time. It, 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 and that it, Western culture is, is heading. Okay, because, because we are so dependent on this on this invisible infrastructure, we're heading for an absolute catastrophe when jihadists figure out how to paralyze the power grid. The entire Culture will be be chaotic. You'll have mobs in the street. Okay, you know, within three days. Okay, when, when so suddenly the the food supply is interrupted and there's no like there's no no way to communicate. There'll be like a robber. I mean that that is the way Western culture is going to collapse. Okay, and, and it it won't take much. It'll just single be a few points days. of failure. Uh, yeah, it, 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 because we are so interconnected yep. and now we are so 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 dependent on communications and computers. It, the, 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 it, I've, I've, I used to predict for years there will be an asteroid hitting there. Yeah, well, and, and you have another. Another, do you, do you know how the solar flares work? So back in, this happens about once every century, so back about 1880, and I, I don't remember the exact year, there was a si significant enough solar flare, so that produces an electromagnetic pulse, like mm -hmm. a hydrogen mm -hmm. bomb, because mm -hmm. the sun is a hydrogen bomb, mm -hmm. and electromagnetic pulse will emerge from the sun and wave across the earth, and it produces huge spikes in, in electrical, mm -hmm. uh, electrical current along anything that's electronic, and it'll burn them out. It, let, it lit telegraph operators on fire in the 1800s, and wow. one of those things took out the Quebec power grid in 1985 and knocked out the whole Northeast Corridor. And so they figure those things are about one in a century event. Mm -hmm. But those single, I have my brother-in-law, who's a very smart guy, he designed the chip in the iPhone. We were talking about political issues the last time I went and saw him in San Francisco. And his notion was that all that the government should be doing right now is stress testing our infrastructure the same way they stress test the banks. Because we're so full of these single points of failure that, and I think you're absolutely right, luckily we've been um, what would you call invaded by stupid terrorists instead of smart terrorists because a, a smart terrorist could do an unbelievable amount of damage in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just God's good graces that that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, and then what will happen is that it's the men, okay? The men will reconstruct civilization while the women cower in the houses and have the men go out and do all the dirty work. That's what's going to happen again. Only men will, will bring civilization back again. Okay? So what, okay, so now a couple of things. So the, the universities, I mean, I've proposed, although it's something that's probably beyond my power, that 
what should happen is that the universities, the real content of the universities should be stolen back from the universities because they're not making use of their intellectual property and that something should be started online that would constitute a genuine university. The problem is the accreditation issue, but I don't think that's an unsolvable problem. But do you see, like all these people who have these postmodern neo-Marxist agendas are completely embedded inside the universities, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? And, 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 and the point is, over the, over the last 25 years, I have received constant mail from people dropping out of the graduate schools, right, and, or, or giving up altogether on any idea of being a college professor. Okay, so what's happened is that the most talented and independent thinking people okay, have avoided in the school. So we, we are now, what, who we have are the compliant, the servile, okay, the people who are currently in the university and, and hiring their successors, yes. okay, are, 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 are maleducated themselves. Okay? I mean, I, I, one of the first letters I received in the early 90s, I'll never forget it, was from a woman who uh, was now uh, painting houses in Missouri and said she had been part of the comparative literature uh, graduate program at, uh, at, you know, at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and that she finally had to drop out because she said every time she would express enthusiasm for what they were reading, the, the, the people looked at her as if she had somehow created an offense. Uh -huh. in, other, in other words, enthusiasm for art, the, the, the very things you need as a teacher in the classroom, okay, were being uh, trained out. Okay, yeah, of, well, of, the of, thing of, is, of the if you respect art and literature, that means that you implicitly accept a hierarchy of quality, right? Yes. And that, of course, contradicts the fundamental tenets of the postmodern doctrine, which is that there are no hierarchies of quality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you talked a little bit earlier about the the idea that you referred again to the idea that everything is associated with power, and that's the, that's the thing that I can't that that's the thing that I can't help but associate with with a kind of personality pathology. Like you know, from a psychometric perspective, the best predictors of long-term success in our society are intelligence (IQ), which you can measure very accurately, and trait conscientiousness, which actually is a real testament to the culture, right? Because what you'd hope is that the smart people who work hard are the people who advance. It, not, it isn't like they deserve it exactly. That isn't what I mean. It's that if the culture is harnessing the productive power of individuals properly, then it should differentially reward people who are smart and conscientious because they're going to do a bunch of really interesting work for the rest of us. And that, that's very well established finding. It's, it's as good as any finding in the social sciences. But despite that, and despite the fact that everything works, which is a goddamn miracle of sorts, there is this consistent story that we live in a patriarchy, that it's only oppressive, that it's done nothing but oppress women since the beginning of time, which is also something that just boggles my mind, you know? Like, I know that... Men have sacrificed for women and children, including their lives, okay, for thousands of years. You know, there, yes, there's been brutality, but the brutality is in the minority, okay? Yes, this, this sick portrayal of human history is nothing but male oppression and female victimage, okay? This is a way to, to permanently ensure the infantilization of women. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Well, and you know, there, you can even make the case from a purely logical perspective. So, so here's an interesting, here's an interesting fact. So, most of the people who abused their children were abused as children, but most of the people who were abused as children don't abuse their children, mm -hmm. right? So, if you look at the population of abusers, they were all abused. So, you can say abuse causes abuse. But that's, that's not a good idea because you have a specific sample there, right? It's not a random sample. What happens is that abuse dampens out of, over the centuries. It, it doesn't propagate itself. And that's obvious because if, there was, if, if the hypothesis of essential ma male tyranny was true, it would spread exponentially through the population in like three generations and there wouldn't be an exception at all. And so what happens is even when there is a tilt towards tyranny, let's say in the family or even in the society, that regresses back to something Thing that's far more benign, very, very rapidly. And you see this, so... Well, to, to me, one, one of the biggest uh, unexamined issues okay, is the transition from the great extended family of old okay, into the nuclear family. Okay? So I, I, and I do feel that Freud is the best analyst of the particular kind of claustrophobic mm -hmm. cell of, of the modern nuclear family. It, 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 could, yeah, be that human it could be that human beings were never intended okay, to, be, to be trapped in a house just with their parents. The, the extended family, your, your aunts and, and, you know, and, and grandparents and, and, and cousins, uh, all of whom helped form your identity. Okay? So one, one had, one's identity 
was, was, was a member of a community, right. Right, rather than in this like hothouse environment. So I think that a lot of current issues, including um, this sudden spate of transgender claims and so on, that a, a lot of these things are coming from um, this un unstable of, in, 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 in cell, it's really a prison cell, of a, of, of a nuclear family. Two parents perhaps cannot give all the knowledge of life okay, to, to, to the young. And so I, I think there are all kinds of, of um, sexual issues you know, in, in it uh, that, that are generated by it. But with the uh, you know, psychology today um, is, uh, is now uh, simply a, mat a, a practical matter. People come in, uh, you know, the psychologist in, in the United States deals with your, your present problem. Let's not go into the distant past, okay? Let's just deal with our present problem, which, are, which obviously we have forms of communication. We need to like fix this and then you'll be fine, okay? As a consequence, there's a complete absence of any kind of analysis of, of your experiences as a child with your parents, you know, with, with your siblings, and so on, how that might relate to your current sexual identity issues, whether it's transgender or whether it's homosexuality. It is impossible. You cannot possibly ask, okay, about any genesis of homosexuality today, okay, because that is automatically defined as homophobic. Well, excuse me, every single, uh, as an openly gay you know, person myself, I, every gay person I know, okay, there is some story there, okay, it seems to be in childhood. Not only that, there's a strange sim you know, similarity of the storylines of all of my friends who are gay, okay. There's the same pattern that had to do with blurred borderlines in, 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 between a, a son and his mother and so on. I'm not blaming the mother, okay? I'm not blaming the mother at all, okay? What I, what I, I see is a dynamic going on in the bourgeois house of the nuclear family, okay, where you had sometimes a, a distant father, okay? A father who was present but, but not, not really engaged, and a mother who, 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 who made, made the son her companion in some way. Often the mother has great imagination and flair, and they had a shared thing. And I, I mean, I, the, the idea that homosexuality has nothing whatever to do, okay, with your family life is nonsense. I well, it's also yes. completely, well, that's another thing. And I got a lot of trouble in Canada for my opposition to Bill C-16, which was a bill that had to do with transgender rights. And I didn't really give a damn about the transgender right issue. That had nothing to do with it. What bothered me was that there was an issue of compelled speech because you were required by the Ontario Human Rights Commission to use the pronouns that, of the person's choice, right? Okay. Otherwise, and that is absolutely or well in that is, That's that, right. that, is a, that is absolutely intolerable. You know, I, I have said I said years ago, okay, that my book, Sexual Persona, which was like a 700-page book, I said that is the biggest sex change in history because I, okay, with my transgender issues, all right, to look to the magnificent construction of English, okay, it was the English language, okay, that I seized on to gain my identity and my power as a person. Right? And therefore, any intrusion into English, someone tell, trying to tell me how to use English, this great gift, okay, to me, this is absolutely obscene and evil okay, for any government to try, to, exactly. try to dictate to us how we're going to use this, this magnificent instrument of English. Yes, absolutely. And, and I, that was, for me, the breaking point because I believed, well, and I think that that's associated with the idea of the logos in the West, you know, because that's a deep mythological idea that the logos is the thing that brings order out of chaos through communicative speech speech and that that's tightly aligned with your soul and I don't care if you're an atheist or a believer it doesn't matter it's still the right language and that no one has any right whatsoever under any circumstances to trespass against that mm -hmm. and so but that's okay because that's law in Canada now and so but okay so now back to your let's see you were making a point about I, I knew we would agree on Oh, everything. yes, okay. Yes. Because it's, it's interesting to look at these things from, obviously, from multiple perspectives, which is another thing ideologues don't do, right? Mm. Because for them, everything is one cause. Yes. There's one, that's how you can tell when you're dealing with someone who's ideologically possessed, is they make everything attributable to a single cause, like power. Yes. So, but, right. so one of the things that's happened with the nuclear family that's quite interesting, too, is that parents are older, and they, and they have fewer children. Mm. So you could imagine that that hothouse environment in some sense has been exaggerated for a bunch of reasons. One is, well, your child is a lot more valuable to you if you're older and you only have one or two, right? Because you're not gonna get another chance. That, first of all, you might have had some trouble having the child to begin with, um, and you're not gonna get another chance. So you've got all your eggs are in one basket, so to speak. And then, of course, children don't have the number of siblings they used to have. And one of the things that's really useful about having siblings is that they keep you in your place, right? They, they're primary socialization agents. And I mean, that can be brutal. 
and that's reflected, say, in the story of Cain and Abel, you know, that that internal household dynamic with siblings can, be, can really become murderous, and that has to be kept under control. But I think the, the, the hothouse flower person who's, who's incapable of tolerating any jibes or any, or any testing, any dominance hierarchy testing of the sort that you said that men do, part of that's the consequence of being raised by older parents who have excess resources, who have no siblings because the, the child is then, of course, special. And that specialness, well, there, there seems to be an inverse relationship between that specialness uh, that's protected and the person's robustness and resilience. And so, and then that's cottoned to, or, or not cottoned to, that's, that's uh, uh, pandered to by the universities, which insist upon setting up a situation where no one is ever offended by anything any of the time, and that's something I also can't understand at all because... But let me just say, that's a yeah. huge point you just made, okay, because it's the upper middle class of the, the professional class, okay, who postpones having the children, okay, because they, they go to law school, they go to medical school, right, and, and, they, and they have the children after they're, they're, they're settled, okay, in a, in, in a job, okay, so they're the, they're the ones, okay, who, who have injected this, this, this hypersensitive bourgeois, idea, you know, code in, into the universities. Now, my, my parents were 20 when they married and 21 when they had me. Okay, yeah, right. my, my father was, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, went, went to college on the GI Bill, getting out of out of World War II. So I, when I was born, my father was still in college and was sweeping fl you know, to floors and so on. I am the product of young parents, and nature wants actually <laughs> young parents, right? Because because pregnancy is is, is quicker, it's safer, right. okay, and so on. And my parents had the energy, okay, to um, you know this youthful energy that can do spirit that came out of World War II. And and so on. I'm a product of that. Then, then uh, my only other sibling uh, was born 14 years later. Okay, my father at this point was a college professor. Okay, All right. so she had completely different parents than than I did. So yeah. she, she has very excellent manners and so on. She's completely different. Okay, All right. And I I have all this like well, the energy. I mean, my, my parents were just out of their teens. Okay, so now today we have this situation. No, and it, it's considered heresy to raise this issue. Okay, that you have have young women are told. Okay, there's one future for you. You are a future leader. Okay, you. Yeah. Must, you must move forward, okay? Four years of college, and then, and then perhaps some a professional class. All right. So, it, it, it maybe the women, young women's bodies, are signaling, okay, that they want to be mothers. Maybe, maybe there are, are signals coming from the body, okay, of maybe now wanting this, this 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 system of education that was devised for men, okay, that's being funneled along, channeled along in this mechanism. All right. So young women, you know, feel unhappy. They don't know why. They feel they. they they have no sense of identity. They, if they if they if they want to marry and drop out of college right, and have have a baby, they will be treated as traitors to their class. Yeah. What you are a future leader? What have a baby? Only working class women would do that. Okay. Yeah. Now what I find working class women, okay, in general, okay far more rounded as personalities, okay? They express themselves forcefully. They have body language that takes up space, okay? A man says something to them on the street, they're right back in their face and so on. It is the bourgeois girls, okay, who are taught that they're, they're special, okay? Who have to postpone actual life, okay, for, for all these years. You see, these, these are the girls who, are, who, are, who misjudge the fraternity party setting. These are the girls who like run for parental protection and hand-holding on, 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 the, on the committee investigating what Went wrong on their date, and so on and so forth. So, so yes, I, I think that what you that you have located that's very interesting. The idea that the, that these these young girls, okay, who are so sensitive, okay, in college, so unable to handle their sex life, are the product of older parents because they went through the professional career track, yeah. right? Yes, and they they are they have not had the you know the experience of the you know competitiveness, you know, and um, and, and teasing of other siblings, and they don't know how to how to. Yes. Well, I, also, you know, yeah. the thing about young parents is they. Don't don't care as much as older parents and that actually turns out to be better mm -hmm. because what you really want for your children is minimum necessary intervention right and, and the, the developmental literature is actually quite clear on this so if you're at home with your child what the best role that you can play is to be there but not to be interacting with the child all the time the child should be off doing whatever it is the children do which generally is playing with other children right without it being mediated also by screens and and, and technology because that's how they formulate their identity mm -hmm. and that's how they learn to play joint games with other people and the parent is supposed to be there as a recourse for the child when they go out a little bit farther than they can tolerate and they have to come back and get some security yeah. and so but that isn't that's especially not what happens to single children because they're basically raised as miniature 
future adults. Mm -hmm. So, and I wonder too, like, how much of the antipathy towards, these are dark musings, and I would say, how much of the antipathy towards men that's being generated by, say, college age women is a, a deep repugnance for the role that they've been designed and a disappointment with the men for, you know, like you think of those, uh, is it Carpathian um, or, or, or uh, um, uh, I can't remember the culture. The, the, the basic mar marital r routine was to ride into the village and grab the bride and run away with her on a horse, right? It's like the, like the motorcycle gang member who rips the two naive women out of, girl out of the bosom of her family. The Sabine you know? women, so like an yeah. ancient myth. Yeah, there, there used to be bride stealing. It was quite, it was quite, quite widespread. Right, yeah. well, so I kind of wonder if part of the reason that modern university age women aren't so, aren't so angry is because that fundamental feminine role is actually being denied to them and they're, they're objecting to that at a really, really fundamental level, like a, a level of, of primitive outrage at, well, and because well, what's happened is the chaos that my generation of the 1960s bequeathed through the sexual revolution. I, when, when I arrived in college in 1964, okay, we, uh, we, the colleges were still acting in local parentis in place of the parent. So at my dormitory, uh, um, all women's dormitory, uh, we women had to sign in at 11 o'clock at night. The men could run free the entire night. So it was my generation of women that rose up and said, give us the same freedom as men have. And the colleges replied, no, um, the world is dangerous, you could be raped, we have to protect you against rape. And what we said, okay, was give us the freedom to risk rape, okay? And so that what that today's women don't understand, it's a freedom that you want, it's the same freedom that gay men have when they go and they pick up a stranger someplace. They know it's dangerous, they know they could end up beaten up or killed, okay, but they find it hot. If you want freedom, if you want equality, okay, then you have to start behaving like a man. Okay? So, so what we did is, is we, we, we gave freedom to these young women, for several generations, but my generation had been raised in a far more resilient and robust culture. Okay, we had the strength, okay, to, to, to know what we wanted and to fight for what we wanted. These young women have been raised in this protective, terribly protected ways. Right? So I, I think, in some strange, you know, um, fashion, that that all these demands for intrusion from these, you know, Stalinist uh, uh, committees, sexual, you know, uh, investigating dates and so on, it's a way to reinstitute, okay the rules that my generation threw out the window. I, so I, th I think these young women are desperate. Not only that, but I have spoken out uh, very strongly in, you know, in, a, in a piece I wrote for Time Magazine, as in my m most recent book, that, that the raising the drinking age in this country, okay, from 18 to 21, okay, has had a direct result, okay, in these in these disasters of binge drinking fraternity parties, because you know, to, to let you know, let college students the way we could go out at, as freshmen, have a beer, sit in a protected adult environment, learn how to discourse with the opposite sex in in in, in a safe you know environment, right, and so on, and you and and, and now today, okay, because because of the stupid rule that, that young people can't even buy a drink, okay, you know, in, in a bar until they're 21, we have these fraternity parties that are that are like it, it's the caveman era. Well, of course, in, in this modern age, it, this is this advantages men, okay. Men want to hook up, men want to have sex. Women don't understand what men want, so, you know. It, women women are like put out because they're hoping that maybe the man will continue to be interested in them, okay. The man just wants experience, okay. The, the hormones drive toward toward to me. I I I theorize. Okay, that the you know the, that the sex drive in men is intertwined with with hunt and pursuit. Okay, yes, and, yes. And so on. I feel absolutely this is what women don't understand. Okay, it, 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 and if women understood what I understand from my transgender perspective, all right, it, these women on the streets. Okay, um, you know, I you know I'm obviously you know Madonna, you know, ad admirer, and you know, I, and I, I I support pornography and prostitution. So I don't want what I'm it's about to say to seem conservative. Is it? It isn't. Okay, what I'm saying is the women on the street, young women. Okay, Okay, who are about, who are jogging? Okay, with no bra on. Okay, short shorts and have and have earbuds in their ears. Okay, just jogging along. Like as I said, they, these women do not understand the nature of the human mind. They do not understand the nature of psychosis. Okay, and this intertwining that I'm talking about. Okay, of of the hunt, the hunt and pursuit thing. Okay, they're tr 
triggering a hunt thing, just what, 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 you, what um, uh, you, you have talked about in, in terms of the zebra herd, okay? They are triggering the hunt okay, uh, impulse okay, in psychotic men, okay? Uh, to have, here, there goes a very appetizing and, and, and totally oblivious animal, okay, bouncing along here, okay? So, and, and we're in a period now where psychosis is not understood at all, okay? And yet young women have had, have had no exposure to movies like Psycho, okay? The, the, you know, the kind of uh, the, the rapist serial murder thing and so on, the, the kind of strange dynamic that has to do with the, with the assault on the, on the mother imago, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the mind of the psychotic. So I think that there's an incredible naivete. These young women are emerging and going to college and in, in this like incredible Dionysian environment of, you know, of, of a sec, a orgiastic sexual experience in fraternity houses, they're completely unprepared for it, right? And, and so you're getting all this outrage. So feminist rhetoric has gotten more and more extreme in its portrayal of men is evil. But in fact, okay, what we have is a chaos. It's a, it's a chaos in the sexual realm. The, the, the girls have not been told anything real okay, in, in terms of, of biological substratum to sexual No, activity. and there's full of lies about what constitutes consent, too. E exactly. And it's be become something that's essentially portrayed linguistically yeah. as a sequence of progressive contracts, which, you know, is... It's, well, I think, you know, I've thought for a while that we're living in the delusional fantasy of a naive 13-year-old girl. That's basically sums up our culture. And I look at all these sexual rules that permeate the, the, the academia, and I think two things. The first thing I think is, well, I know because I was an alcohol researcher for a long time, and you know that 50% of violent crimes are directly attributable to alcohol. So if you're murdered, there's about a 50% chance that you're drunk and about a 50% chance that the person who kills you is drunk. Mm -hmm. And alcohol is the only drug that we know that actually amplifies aggression. Mm -hmm. It does that in laboratory situations. Plus, it's a great disinhibitor, right? So what alcohol does is it, it doesn't make you oblivious to the future consequences of your action. Because if you ask someone who's drunk about the consequences of something stupid, they can tell you what the consequences are. But it makes you not care. And it does that because it's technically an anxiolytic, like, like, like barbiturates or like benzodiazepines. And it also has a, as a, an activating um, uh, property for many people who drink. So it's, it's a stimulant and, a, and an anxiolytic at the same time. And, a, and a very, very potent, it's very potent for both of them. And you know, we put young people together and douse them in alcohol, right, at the binge drinking level. Mm -hmm. And then, which also interferes with memory consolidation, which of course makes things much more complex. Mm -hmm. And then we're surprised when there are sexual misadventures. And, you know, and then it's also attributed almost purely to the predatory element that's, that's uh, part and parcel of masculinity, but a, tr a tremendous amount of that is also naivety and stupidity. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because we expect, like, 18-year-old guys, especially the ones that, aren't, that haven't been successful with girls, which is like 85% of them, because the successful men are a very small percentage of men. The 85% who haven't been successful with men or with women, they don't know what the hell they're doing at all, right? And part of the reason they're getting drunk is to garner up enough courage to actually make an advance. Yeah. You know, and because I think another thing that women don't understand, especially with regards to young men, is just exactly how petrifying uh, attractive woman who's of, say, somewhat higher status actually is to a young guy. And there's lots of guys that write me constantly and people that I've worked with that are so terrified of women they can't even talk to them. Right. It's very, very common. Well, you know, I take a very uh, firm position, which is that I, I want college administrations to stay totally out of the social lives of the students. Yeah. Right? If a crime is committed, it should be reported to the police. I've been writing that for 20, yes. 25 years yes. now. Right? But, but it's not the business of any college administration to take any notice okay, of what the students say to each other, say to each other, as well as do with each other. Yeah. Okay? I want it to totally stop. It is fascism of the worst yeah, kind. I agree. Well, it's, and it's, I think it's fascism of the worst kind because it's, an, it's a new kind of fascism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's partly generated by legislation. So the, like the Title IX mem memo that was written in 2011, yes. I recently got a copy of that goddamn thing. That was one polluting bit of legislation that was. That memo basically told universities that unless they set up a parallel court system, they were going to be denied federal funding. Unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable. Incredible. And, 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 and the, le the leftists are supporting this. I know, right? I know. It's, 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 and this, this shows there is no authentic campus leftism. I'm sorry, it's a fraud. 
Okay, I mean, you, the, 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 we, the faculty should be fighting the administrations on this. Yeah, fighting tooth and the nails. Federal, in, in, in federal regulation of, of you know, how we're supposed to behave on campus. Well, how can, you be so, how can you be so naive and foolish to think that taking an organization like the university, which already has plenty to do, and forcing it to become a pseudo-legal system that parallels the legal system, could possibly be anything but utterly catastrophic. It would mean you would have to know absolutely nothing about the legal system and about the tremendous period of evolution that produced what's actually a stellar system and, and an adversarial system that protects the rights of the accused and of the, and of the victim, and to replace that with an ad hoc bureaucracy that has pretty much essentially the same degree of power as the court system with absolutely none of the training and none of the absolutely. guarantees. The and kangaroo courts. There are kangaroo and courts. And I did that piece that I wrote about date rape, it was in January 1991, uh, Newsday, got uh, the most controversial thing I ever wrote in my entire career. I attacked the entire thing and, and, and demanded that colleges stand back and get out of the social lives of the students, so on, and, and people, the, the reaction, people tried to call they called the president of my university, tried to get me fired. You can't believe the hysteria, okay? I, I can it, believe it. Yeah, it, yeah, it, well, yes, I, yes, you can I believe, can it. believe yeah, it. You can believe yeah, it. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. I, anything, that where, it, it, anything that says to women, okay, that they should be responsible for their own choices is regarded as reactionary? Are they kidding me? Okay, this is such a betrayal of authentic feminism, in my view. Well, it's the ultimate betrayal of authentic feminism mm -hmm. because it's, it, it, it's an invitation of all the things that you might be paranoid about with regards to the patriarchy back into your life, right? Mm -hmm. It's an insistence that the most intrusive part of the tyrannical king come and take control over the most intimate details of your life. Incredible. And Absolutely the, and, incredible. And the, the assumption is that that's going to make your life better rather than worse, right? That and, and not to mention this idea of you know, this, the stages of verbal consent, as if, as if your impulses based in the body have anything to do with words <laughs> and so on. I mean, that's the whole point is, you know, about sex, okay, is to abandon okay, that, you know, that, that part of the brain that's so that, you know, and, and, and entrammeled with words. I mean, there's, you see these- It's these actually a marker of, of life lack of social ability to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're sophisticated, it's not like if you're dancing with someone, it's not like you call out the moves, right? If you have to do that, well, then you're, 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 you're more worse than a neophyte, right? right? You're an right. awkward neophyte. And anybody with any sense should get the hell away from you. And so if you're reduced to the point where you have to verbally negotiate every element of, of intimate interaction, then... What a well, downer. Oh my well, God. Well, that, yes, but what, a, what an unbelievably what would you call it, naive and pathological view of the manner in which human beings interact. Yeah. There's no sophistication in that. Well, what I'm worried about also in this age of social media, uh, I've noticed as a, as a teacher in the classroom that the young people are so used to communicating now by cell phone, okay, by iPhone, um, that they're losing body language and facial expressions, okay, which I think is going to compound the problem uh, with, the, with these dating right, right. Uh, encounters, okay, because the ability to read the, the, the human face and, and, to, and, to, and to read little tiny inflections of emotion, well, I think my generation got that from looking at great foreign films with, with, their, with their long takes, okay, so you'd have Jean Moreau and Catherine Deneuve, okay, in like in potential romantic encounters, and you could just see the tiniest little little inflections, right? they, 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 that, that signal communication or sexual readiness or, or irony or skepticism or distance or whatever. Okay? So the inability to read the, if, if, other people's intentions, okay? that, I think this is going to be a disaster. I, mean, I, I, I just noticed that um, how year by year okay, the, the students are, are becoming much more flat affect. Okay? And, and they themselves complain that they'll sit in the same room with someone and, 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 and be texting to each other. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a piece of evidence, too, that supports that to some degree. So women with brothers are less likely to get raped. Aha! And the reason for Aha. that is that they've learned that nonverbal language deeply, right? Yes. And they can, they, can, they can spot the... the Not only that, okay, but I have, I have noticed, okay, uh, in, my, in my career, okay, that, that women who have many brothers, okay, 
are very good, okay, as administrators and as business people, okay, all right, because they don't take men seriously, okay. They regard, they, 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 they saw their brothers, they think their brothers are jokes, okay, but they know how to control men, okay, while, while they still like men, okay, they admire men, all right. So I, that, this is something I, that I have seen, you know, repeatedly, okay. Yeah, well, so that would be also reflective yeah. of the problem of fewer and fewer siblings. Yes, that's right, okay, yeah, yeah, in, 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 I've, I've noticed this in publishing, okay, that, that, that the, um, the, the, the women who have this jo the job of publicist, okay, and rise to the top as, as manager of publicity, okay, their ability to take charge of men and, and, and their humor at men, and they have great relationships with men, okay, because they don't have the, the sense of resentment and, 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 and worry and anxiety and, and so on. They don't see men as aggressors, okay, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's another thing, too, is that as feminism, um, you know, uh, moved into its present its, uh, system of ideology, okay, it has tended to uh, denigrate motherhood, okay, yes. as, as a lesser order of human experience and, and to enshrine, of course, abortion. Now, I am 100% of, of abortion rights. I, you know, I, I belonged to Planned Parenthood for years until I, I finally rejected it as a branch of the Democratic Party, my own party, and so on. Um, but, but as motherhood became excluded, as, as feminism became obsessed, okay, with the, with, with, the work, with the professional woman, okay, I feel that the lessons that, that mothers learn have been lost, okay, you know, to, 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 to feminism, okay, which is, okay, that if, they, if, if the, the mothers who, who bear boy children, okay, understand the fragility of men, the fragility of boys, they understand it, they don't, they don't see boys and men as a menace, they understand the, the greater strength of women, okay, so there's this tenderness, you know, and connectedness between the, between the, the mother and the, and the boy child, okay, when motherhood is part of the experience, okay, of, of women who are discussing gender. So, so what we have today is that this, this gender ideology has risen up on campuses where, where all, none of, the, none of the girls, none of the students have married, none of them have had children, okay? And you have, you have women, some of whom have had children, but a lot of them are lesbians or like, or like, or, you know, or like professional women and so on, okay? So this, this, the whole tenderness and forgive, forgiveness, okay, and encouragement that women do to, to boys, okay? The fragility, they don't understand, this hypersensitivity of boys is not understood, okay? Instead, boys are seen as somehow more privileged, okay, and somehow you know their 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 energy level is is, is interpreted as aggression, okay, mm -hmm. potential violence, and so on, okay, right. Uh, so I, I think that that the, the, that what we would do better, okay, if we would have I, I have proposed, okay, that colleges should allow uh, the moment a woman is ent is entered, okay, she has entrance to that college for life, okay, and that she that, that she should be free. To, to leave, okay, to have babies when she, when her body wants to have babies, when it's healthy to have them, okay, and then return, have, have, have the occasional course, okay, build up credits, and, and fathers, I mean, you might be able to do it as, as well, and so on, to get married women, women with children, into the classroom. The moment that happens, it, it's happened after World War II, okay, where you had, you had a lot of ma married guys in the classroom, okay, and so on, not yet that, that many women, the experience of a married person with a family, okay, talking about gender, but most of the gender stuff would be left out of the room, okay, if you had a real mother in there who had experienced you know, childbirth and had, and, had ra and had was raising boys and so on. So I think that's, that's also, a, you know, something that uh, has led to this, this, this incredible, art, you know, artificiality and, uh, and hysteria, okay, well, of feminist <laughs> rhetoric. There's, an, there's another strange element to that, which is that on the one hand, the, the radical feminist types, the neo-Marxist, post-modernists are, are very much opposed to the patriarchy, let's say, and that's that unidimensional ideological representation of our culture. It has never existed. I mean, per perhaps the word can be applied to Republican Rome and that's it. Okay. Well, and it, maybe it could be applied usefully to certain kinds of tyranny, but not to a society that's actually functional. Victorian England, one, one, arguably, okay, but, but other than that, to use the word patriarchy in, that, in, the, in a slapdash way, so, so amateurist, absolutely, absolutely, you know, it just shows people know nothing about history, whatever, have, have, have done no reading. So, and so what confuses me about that is that despite the fact that the patriarchy is viewed as this essentially evil entity, and that that's associated with the masculine energy that built this oppressive structure, the an antithesis of that, which would actually be femininity, as far as I can tell, which is tightly associated with care and with child rearing, is also denigrated. So mm -hmm. it's like the only proper role for women to adopt 
is a patriarchal role, despite the fact that the patriarchy is something that's entirely corrupt. So the hypothesis seems to be that the patriarchy would be just fine if women ran it. So no changes, it's just that it would just be a transformation of leadership and somehow that would, that would rectify the fundamental problem even though it's hypothetically supposed to be structural. Okay, so I'm gonna close with something. So, you know, there are elements in my character that are optimistic. You know, I've, I've looked, for example, I worked for a UN committee and, and on the relationship between economic development and sustainability, and I found out a variety of things that were very optimistic, like the fact that, you know, the UN set out to have poverty between 2000 and 2015 worldwide and actually hit that by about 2010, right? So we're in the period of the fastest transformation of the bottom strata of the world's population into something approximating middle class that's ever occurred. Mm -hmm. And there's all these great technological innovations on the horizon and, and it looks to me like things could go extraordinarily well if we were careful, but I'm not optimistic. And maybe that's me, I'm pessimistic because I also see that there's five or six things happening, all of which appear at the level of catastrophe that are all happening at the same time. And so one of the things that I'd like to ask you is like, what do you see happening in the next 10 years in, in the universities or in culture at large? And I mean, you just put forward a proposal for the universities for the treatment of women, which I think is a very interesting one because women do have a different time frame than men. But like, what the hell is the proper way forward? I've been encouraging young men to tell the truth and to take responsibility and there's a huge market for that message. But but I'm not convinced by any stretch of the imagination that it's enough. What, like, when you look forward and you try to be optimistic, what the hell do you see? Well, in, in, in the largest uh, you know, uh, scale, um, I'm concerned about the future of Western culture because uh, as a student of history, it looks too much to me like ancient Rome, okay, which became overexpanded, uh, which became, it was at the mercy of, of, of bureaucratic um, uh, um, uh, creep, okay? Uh, and, uh, I can imagine and, one of them. Yes, and, right. And, the, and, the, and Roman identity eventually um, got blurred, okay, in, in its incorporation of, of so many different cultures, which at first seemed like a healthy kind of multiculturalism, but eventually yes. overexpanded and simply collapsed collapse of its own way. So I, I, and I, so I am concerned about the, you know, whether Western culture is in a rapid decline. I think it would be very easy because we are, you know, so interconnected and so over complex, very easy, you know, to bring it to, to ruin. It, it would only take one major natural disaster, you know, to, to, to do that. But the universities themselves, I mean, I think people are, are all of a sudden in, in the United States much more um, attentive to issues of political correctness because of the, the riots at Berkeley which was the, you know, which was the capital of free speech. I mean, that, that, I mean the, the free speech movement happened in the, the spring uh, before I entered college in 1964. It's, it's one, one of the great principles and, and, and inspirational stories of my entire life, Mario Savio's, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, assertion of, 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 the, of the supremacy of, you know, free thought and free speech. Yeah. Okay. And I, uh, so I, I think that perhaps, you know, we, we might just have turned a corner, and, but it's gonna take a very, very long time for the university to be reformed. I feel, Okay, that the cafeteria menu okay, of, of um, the university curriculum has to be abandoned, that we, we must return to historical uh, courses that begin in, in, in the earliest period, yeah. the Stone Age and antiquity, in order to give perspective you know, to, to, our, to our present to an analysis of our, of our present uh, culture. I want um, uh, 50, 50 to 75 percent of college administrators fired, okay, and the money be transferred over okay, to, um, to, to faculty, into libraries, and to, into, to instruction. Okay? Um, I, I think that um, you know, the, the, obviously, the, the, the way things are being people are being trained right now, including at the public school level, okay, is I, I think that I think the public school level has gone to hell. Okay? When, my, when, when, when my mother came, you know, came to the United States at the age of six, the, 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 the old public school system was still very strict. And therefore, and she had um, excellent education, you know, it's, uh, and um, you know, did, got all A's in, in, in her, in her in, even though she started out not speaking English, spoke without an accent, et cetera. Okay, so, so, so today, this, this kind of feel-good public school education, uh, which, is, which is a form of ideology and indoctrination right now, it's, it's all about no bullying, okay, and so on, and not about anything. And not even seriously about no bullying. Uh, yes, yeah, and so I, mean, I, I can tell in my own students, I mean, I've been teaching for 46 years, 
So I can tell the, the slow degradation of public school education okay, to, the, to the point now that the, that the students have absolutely no sense of world geography, mm -hmm. of world history. Okay, they, they know absolutely nothing. They, not, they don't know anything about wars. Okay, yeah. and, and, and the reality, the, 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 the barbaric reality of most of human history. Okay, and, and what a, what a fantastic, that's triggering. Yeah, what a, right. What a fantastic culture we live in, and so on. Now, identity politics itself has just got to stop. I mean, it was important once. Okay, okay I I was a rebel against the, the wasp, you know, um, hegemony. Okay, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant hegemony in American culture. It was uh, it was suffocating. I, I I was raised in the 1950s, right? They, when wasps controlled corporations and 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 education and politics and so on. And so, it, identity politics was necessary once. Okay, to to we assert gay rights, okay, with the Stonewall Rebellion of 1969. We, assert, we asserted, okay, the women's rights with the, with, the, with the rebirth of second wave feminism in the late 1960s, okay, but this endless, okay, preoccupation with, with a fragmented identity, we must return to the authentic 1960s vision, which is about identity coming from consciousness, which transcends gender, which transcends all these divisions of race, okay, and, and ethnicity, okay, consciousness itself, Okay, right. We, 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 there's no sense of that any longer. That's what the 1960s saw. Well, I see of that as a complete abandonment of personal responsibility. Yes. Because that, like, that consciousness, I think, symbolically, and I got a lot of this from Jung and also from Eric Neumann. I mean, that's the great logos of the West, right? That's the transcendent principle, which is, is respect for the primacy of individual consciousness. And what goes along with that primarily isn't individual rights, although that's built into it. I mean, that's the reason we have individual rights, is for respect for that. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility that comes along with being an individual instead of the member of some group, especially yes. a victimized group, which is yes. like the, a sure, I, I wrote an article with one of my students who had toured the mass grave sites in, in the former Yugoslavia, you know, and had been expo exposed to that sort of thing. And one of the things that our research indicated was that the best predictor of genocide is uh, victimization on the part of the group that produces the genocide, right? A sense of an accelerated sense of victimization, and then it's well, we get them before they get us. Mm -hmm. So, and everyone's being taught now that they're a victim, and then no one seems to have any sense that you know that's part of the essential tragedy of being that. Life is suffering, and that, mm -hmm. and that, and that, and that, and that the world rests on a foundation of suffering. It's nothing to take personally, and, mm -hmm. and something to take responsibility for instead of blaming and, and resentment and all of the things that have polluted our universities and our culture. Well, and there also was the abandonment, okay, of the um, you know of of, of the canon. Okay, the, people uh, you know asserted that the canon was the product of bias and again of a, you know of a of a you know provincial elitism and so on. But in, in point of fact, as a student of the history of the arts, okay. I I can I can assure people that the canon, okay, ov overwhelmingly so, is is the result of what artists have determined. Okay, we 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 right. we, we say a, a work is important, is canonical because artists following it, okay, were influenced by it. We have this like beautiful cascading tradition right. of influence. All right, so so that, that that's so it's another but not another part of the philistinism, okay, of of current education, mm -hmm. to to you know to believe that there are these external reasons, okay, for for the why. A work lasts. Why a work, you know, uh, written 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, has global yeah. relevance? As if it's some sort of political conspiracy yes, that's based that's right. on power. Yes, As if anybody right. could even manage that, no yes. matter how nefarious they were. Yes, right. Right. But also, you know, it, 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 we we in the 60s you know, had the, had the idea, okay, that there was a, like this the, a human human sensibility, okay, that, that transcended individual nations and, and so on, right, and that and that there was this like rubric, for, you know, cosmic consciousness, okay, this uh, this uh, sense of the universe as a whole, and, and to, to see the human being in relationship to great eternal principles of you know life and death, mortality, and so on, uh, whereas you know Marxism is blind. Marxism is very narrow. All it sees is a society. Okay, it sees nothing beyond society. It doesn't see nature. Okay, <laughs> I mean it's absolutely mad. Okay, <laughs> how you can have a system being taught? Okay, in universities, right? Which 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 thinks that this tiny thing of society, okay, compared to the enormity and beauty of, of, 
of nature. Okay, it should take all of our, uh, you know, all of our, you know, absorb all of our uh, energy and attention. So, I mean, I just think that there's like a parochialism, a provincialism, uh, you know, it, 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 it now a kind of, um, you know, uh, systematized elitism in our current education has just got to be rooted out. And we, I want to return to basics, great simplicities. And I, I, all these faculty members teaching their little tiny courses that have to, has to do with their own specialty. That's got to stop. Okay, people, people can pursue whatever they want in their private research as scholars. Okay, certainly that's necessary, but they must teach in the core curriculum. All right? I, I, and, 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 and people must decide what is crucial for an educated person to know. Yeah. I do want a multicultural. I do want a global curriculum. Okay, I want, I want all the cultures taught. Okay, right. This is not the answer. Mar Marxism, this neo-Marxism in the universities. Okay, is simply it's lazy. It's a lazy way to assert multiculturalism without actually doing the research and the study of other cultures. Okay. All right. That's a good one to close on. We agreed on everything. I knew it. I knew it. All right, great. Thank you very much.